Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. If you've been following this show over the years, you've uh, heard me say that sometimes I do dance performances uh, as Santa Claus, as Uncle Sam, as Don Juan de Oñate and other characters. And my motto is, I'm not good, but I'm fun. <laughs> In uh, 2004, I got a telephone call. I believe it was December. Well, I know it was December from a woman that said she had a home health care service and wanted me to come and do a dance performance for her patients. She said I only have about five patients, uh, but said um, uh, some of them have all, Alzheimer's and things like that, and could you come and do a party for us? So I go and I do Santa Claus as a party for them. At some point I said to her, you know, I know that some of these patients that you have here don't know that I'm even here. Or they may, we don't know for sure that they know that I'm here. But their relatives who are here for the party, they know I'm here. And we're bringing some joy to them and a chance to have fun and relax in dealing with these crisis situations. A couple of years later, I get a call from a woman and she says, could you do a dance performance about 20 minutes of a part of a two hour show at the Shamazal for end of life caregivers? people that work with people such as Alzheimer and strokes and others that they're terminal. And could you come and perform? And we, I got a colleague, uh, Carolyn Buchanan, to go with me as my dance partner. And I performed as Dr. William Yandel, a famous doctor of El Paso's past, wore my top hat and tails and so on. And the same thing, that performance and those others that were performing for those two hours were helping those caregivers to find relief respite. And I still have those wonderful memories. Today I'm going to do a show about hospice. I asked my wife to come and be on the show because in recent years we've gone through hospice care situations with her father and Alzheimer's situations with her mother and with our brother-in-law. And joining us today for our conversation is Jim Paul, who is with Hospice El Peso. Jim, glad to have you here today. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for having me here. A very sensitive and touching subject we're going to deal with. And Shanna yeah. Blevins, my wife, sometimes at home when we're watching my TV <laughs> show, she talks to the television set. Now she gets to be on the channel, and when we watch it, I can talk to her about <laughs> the television set. So Shanna, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. We've been together for almost 56 years. It's wonderful. Now, now Jim Paul, are you a native El Pasoan? I am. I was born here. Okay. And you went to what schools? In grade school, I was at St. Patrick's, and then uh, went to El Paso High School, and then went to Texas Western, and then furthered my education in Vietnam, and then came back and thought it was more to my benefit to educate myself at UTEP than Vietnam. So oh, that's, okay. that's <laughs> you bet. That's where I graduated from UTEP. Okay, and, and, and El Paso High is celebrating a big anniversary right now. One hundred years. Yes, yeah. it's going to be exciting in September. Yeah, I've had some people on the show talking about that particular oh, situation. Okay. Great. Well, I wasn't there when they started it. Yeah. Oh, no, you're not there. Like My mother went there. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you really are native. Uh, now, Shannon, tell us about your connection to El Paso. Well, I went to Scaredy Great School, and then I went through my junior year at Esleta High School. And then my dad was with El Paso Natural Gas, and we moved to Odessa and I finished school there and then went on to Wayland Baptist College. Ended up at, uh, I went some at UTEP, but every time I started UTEP, I had a baby. So I decided, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> and so I finally graduated from uh, West Texas State. Okay, so she followed where I was getting jobs to teach, oh, and we okay. ended up coming <laughs> back helps, here. Right? Yeah. yeah, and we came back here in 1972, yeah. me teaching here and Shanna teaching with the El Paso School District, working with deaf children oh, and a long career in that particular field. Now, I have seen you in the past at senior expos and grandparents' days with your group set up and other hospice organizations set up. And then, of course, I followed a bit of your career with a baseball team. You want to tell us a little bit about that? How did you get into baseball? Well, it, it was a really kind of a fluky thing. I uh, I was I was working at Southwestern University in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, mm -hmm. Southwest Louisiana, not Southwestern, but Southwest Louisiana, and uh, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed Lafayette, Louisiana. I enjoyed the Cajun people. They reminded me so much of our Mexican culture here. Mm -hmm. 
and they're just as outward going and as friendly and as happy bunch of people as you'll ever run mm -hmm. into. But um, at the same time, we uh, the NCAA put us on probation uh, for some problems that the basketball team had or the coaches. So I came out here to go to my brother's wedding and uh, a couple of friends of mine said, we'd like you to come back to El Paso and run the baseball team, which was known as the Sun Kings at the time. Right, right. I really didn't want to do that, but I could, thought I could leverage that at, at the university because uh, they had eliminated uh, the <clears throat> president resigned, the vice president resigned, the athletic director resigned, athletic director resigned, a couple of other people, oh, and they got rid okay. of the whole, they put the basketball program, uh, they gave it the okay. death penalty. Well, I bluffed the, the incoming president trying to make him see that I would be a great athletic director. Okay. And he couldn't make that decision at the end, so I told him I'd come back to El Paso and run the baseball team. Oh, okay. And then uh, later I bought the team the following year for $1,000, which is all the money I had in my whole life. <laughs> so uh, that ride, most of the people of El Paso kind of have an idea that how we started at Dudley Field and progressed to Cohen Stadium. But um, after, after 25 years, I sold the baseball club and ended up being athletic director at New Mexico State, which is something I really wanted to do, and they needed help at the wow, time. Okay. And um, so I, I did that, and then uh, worked a little bit with uh, the George Bush for president campaign, and then just kind of freelanced and did uh, all kinds of um, consulting work, and uh, just happened to fall into it because uh, uh, a guy that had an office across the parking lot from me uh, on Mesa Street, uh, Ralph Adami uh, was on the board at Hospice, and they were looking for a new director. Oh, okay. So I went over to see him and asked him, hey, I think I can do this job. And they go, well, you're a dollar late and a day short because we picked somebody yesterday, but you might be able to help us in development, public relations and marketing. And I said, oh, good. So that's how it, that's how it started. Now this is advertised as the only Nonprofit hospice in El Paso. Is, that, is correct. that correct? That's correct. Uh, tell the audience what that means. <clears throat> well, it means that uh, number one, that uh, we were founded here locally 36 years ago, mm -hmm. when there were no hospices. Yeah, I don't think there was any hospices in the state of Texas when we were founded, and that was by a group of physicians, most of them oncologists, mm -hmm. that said people are dying and there's no way to help them. There's no way to help the caregivers. There's no way. Nobody's doing anything. You know, they're just either dying at home in pain mm -hmm. and with no comfort and with no understanding, or they're in a hospital. And that's not the right way to die. And so that's how they formed a group, incorporated it as a non-for-profit, and started the first hospice here in El Paso. And it was probably the only hospice for about 15, 20 years. And then people started figuring out, well, maybe there's a lot of money that may be made in this, and then corporations come in. and. So that's, that's kind of the difference. We answer only to a board of directors of 20 El Paso people. Mm -hmm. They're not paid to be on that board, mm -hmm. but they monitor everything we do. I answer to them. And uh, we have 125 employees. And uh, so the difference is we were founded to take care of people, show them comfort and care, and make their passing understandable and as, and as gracious as and painless as possible, mm -hmm. um, and and, it, and and the cost is not a factor for us. And since the founding, we take all patients. We don't discriminate in any form or fashion. If they are hospice appropriate, meaning that they have a terminal diagnosis, mm -hmm. they can be with us six months, a year, and um, and that and that, that was that was that was what we were set up for. That's what we do as a nonprofit community hospice. The others are looking at bottom lines, mm -hmm. and they have to, they, there's a lot of them do wonderful jobs, but it's still, you know. Well, to pay your employees, you have to have money come in, so oh, it's for insurance, and <coughs> sure. donations, and oh, what are, mm -hmm. whatever these are. Now, the reason I asked Shannon to be on this is because uh, about the time that I had this uh, respite, end-of-life caregiving program I went to, her father found himself in need of hospice. So, mm -hmm. Shannon, you want to tell us about this and your feelings of what was going on then? Well, we were very fortunate. We were not in El Paso. They were in Fort Worth. And so uh, my dad was able to make the decision for himself. That's a good it thing. It is time 
for me to go to hospice. Mm -hmm. The hospital had already told him he had congestive heart failure. And they had said, we have done all we can do, and all we're doing is bringing you back when, you know, and he didn't want to be brought back. And so he made the decision, I'm ready to go. Well, when I got down there, they called us into a room. They laid it all out for us. They told exactly what was going to happen, exactly what was to be expected. And fortunately, they put him in a hospice unit mm -hmm. and moved him to a great, it was like a luxury hotel, mm -hmm. you know. And they had everybody there. They not only took care of him, but they took care of us. Sure. And that they provided a chaplain, a social worker, nurses. They came to see, you know, if we needed anything. And, and it was very, very peaceful. Mm -hmm. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I've already said, can you transfer me back when that's <laughs> <I go?" Sure. laughs> Can well, you take me back there, uh, please? Of course, we heard from others that they didn't have such a pleasant experience with hospice. Really? Yeah, but most of them we've heard from that was, it was very helpful. Well, we're running about a 92% um, high satisfaction rate. Oh, yeah. That's great. That's <coughs> we, you know, when you talk about hospice and all the benefits that go with it, uh, you'll also find that about half the work we do is with the, the living, the caregivers, right, the yeah. family, those That's that are right. going to remain behind. And, and what they did with you is they, they taught you, they, they educate you on what's going to happen. What is hospice? What does it do? And what are the signs and the, sim, uh, the signals that you will see in your, your father and his passing? There are stages that about 85% of us are going to go through right. before death. But the more educated you are about it, the more comfortable you are. It's the unknown that scares you. But having the, the working knowledge that they gave you and him, then, then everybody knew what we were doing. And, and the wonderful thing I like to talk about in regard to our, our wonderful nurses that uh, visit uh, the homes every day mm -hmm. is they, they, if we take somebody brand new and we'll say, let me have your hand. I've gone down this road many a time right. and I know what we're going through and I'm going to take you and we're going to go all the way to the end. I'm going to be right there with you. That's reassuring for the patient. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the family buys into it. Now, not all family dynamics are always as exactly. comfortable as yours. And the counselors are sensitive that uh, I was in a case one time here in El Paso of an AIDS patient that was dying, mm -hmm. a young man. And I knew when it was time for me to step out and just the parents be there with him. Mm -hmm and say goodbye. And mm -hmm. most of your people are trained to deal with that, whether they want them there still, Absolutely. or whether it's time for them to step out. Well, we had then a, a not so good experience with my mother, but I always thought that my mother was in a nursing home and she couldn't make that decision for herself. Mm -hmm. So that put an added pressure, I think, on my sister and I to have to come to that decision by herself. And, uh, on that situation, I don't think we were told uh, as much as I had been. In other words, the nursing home used their own hospice, hmm. and they didn't tell me that I could have had my mother in the same place my dad was. Uh, the other thing that happened with her is they started the hospice and, and this really kind of bothered me in the fact that they left my mom in the room where she'd been, and she was in a room with a lady who had MS. And the lady was smart as a whip and sweet as she could be, and I almost felt like it was so much pressure on her to have yeah. us in there with her. And uh, so that kind of bothered bothered me. And then the fact that they seized medication before they had the other medication to start my mother. So my mother suffered a full eight hours before they got it. So it was just a whole different. And what they didn't know is I had called uh, before and asked them 
if if I had to use the the nursing homes hospice, and the lady at the other hospice told me no, I did not. That's right. That I had the choice to make, and so I had the phone number in my pocket, ready to make that decision when my mother passed. Jim, let me ask you some success that's, that's, stories with your people that work with you. Mm -hmm. They're changed by these experiences they're working with when they come to you. They come out of standard nursing and then they become specialized hospice nurses. Tell us about that. Well, <clears throat> most of the nurses we have are, first of all, they, they need to have two or three years nursing experience before mm -hmm. we'll, mm -hmm. we'll take them on. And then they, they shadow and work with uh, uh, our team leaders and our, uh, you know, the, the, the head of nursing for, our, for the hospice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's a learning process that they go through and it's about a good six or seven weeks before we even let them handle a, a patient mm -hmm. on their own. Okay. And uh, the, the thing uh, that, that's, that's so important is that to me in regard to a, a nurse that we have anyway is that there are other jobs that nurses can find in El Paso County. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in demand and it takes a special human being to want to do what they do as hospice nurses. And I tell people, especially about our inpatient that we have, uh, we're the only ones with an inpatient also, uh, that if you don't think there are angels walking around this earth, then come on over to Hospice El Paso. We put them in scrubs so you don't see their wings. Mm -hmm. But it takes a special person to do what they do and, and, and they give of themselves, which really is hard on them, tough on them, yeah, right. because they, they get attached, you know, and then the person passes and then they're, they're very sad and there's a, there's, a, there's a period there where it's really tough on them. But uh, they are so involved and they, there's so many more jobs they could have. It's, an, uh, it's not like we overpay or anything like that mm -hmm. or our pay scales are within any reach of anybody, but it's, it takes a special human being to be a, a uh, chaplain with us. We have four chaplains or a social worker. Uh, we have five of them and uh, the, the nurses that go out into the homes or the nursing homes or that are up at our inpatient. The inpatient is for really acute patients that probably will not last more than 36 to 48 hours. Okay. But those are real angels up there and there isn't a day go by that we don't get compliments in. And, 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 it, and it's because the people didn't know, but when they get there, they learn the process. Right. And the more you learn, the more educated you are about what's going on, the less fear you have. Well, I had a, a certain peace with my dad. I just felt great. Mm -hmm. You know, they were always there, and yet they weren't hovering either, you know. It was like when I needed a friend, mm -hmm. they were there. Mm -hmm. And so I have great, fond memories. Well, well, when Shanna's, very fortunate. When Shanna's uh, mother was very, very ill and with Alzheimer's, at the same time, our brother-in-law had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And we kept saying, you know, they're going to kill the caretaker before they die sometimes. You've heard that, <laughs> that over happened, and over yeah. and over. Yeah. And her sister yeah, actually helps. had a car wreck one morning going to work because she was so fatigued and everything from being at the hospital, et cetera. She just drove right into a telephone pole and was in the hospital for several weeks. Well, so. that's Alzheimer's, my mom had it too, so mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah. But, and, 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 and you made a wonderful point just a minute ago about people don't understand or don't know enough about hospice to know they legally have a choice and they must be given a choice. And sometimes yeah. uh, in the case of your mom uh, in that uh, nursing home, they decided who they're working with that's exactly Those are our buddies, and that's uh, and when you hear the the a, a, a doctor tell you, there's nothing more we can do. This is terminal, so you need to get your uh, things in order. If they'll even tell you, because here we have a problem in El Paso, them just not wanting to deliver that, right. that message because right. they spend their whole career curing people and make them better. Now they have to say you're gonna you're terminal and you're not gonna pass, but. Then the mindset of, 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 of people like yourself there being with your father or with your mom or your sisters or anybody else, <clears throat> it, it, it changes and this is really a traumatic thing that happens. And so when somebody says, oh, well, we'll get a hospice here and don't worry, they'll come and tell you all about it. You're, you're just like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, my most important thing is my, my dad be comfortable, something that they, you don't think, well, wait a minute, I got a choice. 
But at that, at that point, there's so much drama and there's so much going on in your mind that you just, okay, whatever. And you assume that they're going to give you the very best. Right. And, and a, lot of, a lot of times they're right and sometimes they're not. Yeah. Well, it's important then, I guess, to do some research and looking ahead and thinking about it. Even though we don't like to talk about dying, that we need to know some places to contact and who to contact when it comes up. Absolutely. Because you, you can talk to two or three hospices and see what, they, what they're going to provide and, what, you know, and get a feel for it. Well, I, I thought that this afternoon, in fact, when I was thinking about coming over here, I thought, you know, just as we plan our end of life funeral type of thing, we ought to look into some of the things that are available to mm -hmm. help passing easier, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's it's not for me, for my children right. or my husband, right. whoever is going to have to make that decision for me. Absolutely, and having gone through it with two incidents already, right? You you've got to you've got to grasp of what it is and what what you really want, and like you and your sister having to make a decision for your mom because she couldn't make the decision like your dad was able to. You pretty much know what she would want, and you have to kind of clear right. your mind and say. You know, mom doesn't want us to just keep feeding her with tubes and stuff like right. this. Let her, that's a tough decision. It's a real tough decision. It's easier for us to talk about it here on TV than it is to make that decision. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you and your sister had to go through it. But once that's made, and that commitment's made, then as you said, like in, in Fort Worth, all this team of people come in and they're all caring special people. I don't have anybody that do, works for me for Hospice El Paso that's doing it because they, we pay so well. All right. Mm -hmm. they, you have to have something here. You really have to have something mm -hmm. here. And uh, that's why we, we spend more money on our patients. Um, I mean, that's just a fact for Medicare. But we're not in it to, we're not paying dividends. <laughs> well, I, I work with Mary Yanis as a volunteer in the senior adult program at Community College. Mm -hmm. And I've known a lot of the uh, people in teaching art and dance and other kinds of subjects. And I've heard several of them say this, you know, it's real hard. I fall in love with these old people and then they keep dying off on me. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, but you have learned how to deal with that because there are others that you can now help. They've passed on. Now you're working with someone else to teach mm -hmm. them how to do art or how to dance mm -hmm. and so on. But you fall in love with some of these people. Mm -hmm. You do. You do. And, and you're going to be in that position one day, too, and you're going to hope that you have a Marianas or somebody like that working with you mm -hmm. or a hospice nurse like that. Right, exactly. Right. You know, that's, that's important. That's, that's our whole purpose. That's why we were founded, and that's still today. That's, what we, that's all we care about. Well, don't you find it better than managing a baseball team? <laughs> that you're doing social service work. It's different. Things. <laughs> I know it's you're a sports different. guy. I know you're a sports guy. But uh, I've been asked a lot of times, there are a lot of things you can do, Blevins. Why are you teaching? And I say, because I like to make a difference in people's lives. There you go. Now, I know you make a difference in people's lives as a sports director, and you mm -hmm. see people mature and grow and play fairly in the sport. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different thing. But I can just see that you have, a, it's a ministry in a sense. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, certainly it's a completely different way of giving back uh, to the community. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very rewarding. Maybe so. Well, and I kept remembering after when my dad passed, I thought, you know, if I lived in this area, mm -hmm. I would volunteer here. There's bound to be something I could do because mm -hmm. it was a, a pleasant experience. And so. Sometimes you need somebody just to hold your hand. Or just to sit we with you, just to know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we read a book, you know. Yeah. Well, that's what we do. We have volunteers. Right. It'll come to the house, and if uh, you've been the caregiver and you need to get out for about two or three hours, maybe go to a movie or something, right. the volunteer comes and sits with the patient. A lot of times they read to him. Sometimes they just talk to him. Maybe they'll play games with him. You know, the thing is, when the diagnosis, the terminal diagnosis is given, you got six months. The problem, the biggest complaint, the biggest complaint that hospice gets is, if I only knew what you all do, I would have got you on board time much, much sooner. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. See, we, especially in this community, we, we equate hospice with immediate death, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You can, it's six months, and that can be extended 
three months at a time yeah, by just a face-to-face. -face you don't maybe. know. No, you don't know. You know. Would, would you like to give a telephone number? You're talking about volunteers. Do you have a number you'd oh, like yeah, to put up? Okay, certainly. give us that. It's a 532-5699. Uh, so say it again so we get right. 532 Five six nine nine. We've okay. got about a hundred and five volunteers that help. Wow! And those are special people too. Or you go to the internet and type in Hospice El Paso, mm -hmm. and you find information. Just go right to our website, okay. Hospice El Paso. Well, that's the whole purpose of this program. It's it's informational, educational, and puts people in touch with other people that can be interested in right. this. And, and you're going to find so many caring, concerned people, and they're very comforting. And they know what they're doing, and they know how to do it, and they they know how you're feeling. That's that's another big thing, you know. When when we tell somebody, or we tell somebody, you're you're terminal, and you're not, you know, we're going to have to start dealing with yeah. this. Their mindset is different. I don't care about reading the paper. I'm not going to be here in six months. You know, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. and and then how do you talk to somebody that's going to die? And the person talking to him, how do I know what to say? How do I know? What to say to somebody who's going to die? Yeah, you know, I had a case one time at Grandparents' Day. A man he sees me there, and we're talking about reading to people or teaching people to read and their things. Mm -hmm. This man says, "Why would you want to teach them? They're going to die pretty soon." Mm -hmm. And my answer to that was, "Everybody needs to be kept active. Even if you're old, you need to be kept active. And if you can't read and write, somebody's going to take mm -hmm. advantage of mm -hmm. you." And so that's my approach to that. Even to the very last minute, we Absolutely. need to be in touch. Well, we only have about a minute left. Do you want to have a concluding thought on this, Jim? No, it's just a wonderful conversation. And, <laughs> and, and, and this, this helps us in educating the people of El Paso about what hospice is and what it does. Mm -hmm. And the sooner you get into it, the better you are. You're not giving up. You're, you're, what you're doing is recognizing, number one, we're all going to die. Yeah. We have a hard time with that. And number two, let us help you. Let us take your hand, like I said, and go down this path with you and help the, 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 your caregivers and, the, and your, your loved ones there to understand this. And then when you understand it, you get a grasp of it. You're not afraid of it. So the worst thing in the world is to get us with uh, 24 hours to go. We don't get to do anything to make things better for everybody. Well, we're fortunate being in El Paso. Even though it's a big city, there's a community atmosphere about the way we interact with each other still in this city. Thank and goodness. And that is wonderful. Thank goodness. And our time is about gone. And I want to thank those of you in El Paso watching this show for being caregivers for all of us and loving us as human beings in the city of El Paso. Tune in again for another future program. I'm Leon Blevins. <music>